Hi everybody and welcome to Murder at Bedtime. This is a 15 to 20 minute, no frills, no waffle, true murder bedtime story. All the waffle is at the end. As usual, I think you are all awesome. And with that, let's crack on. Doreen looked up at the clock. When she had bumped into Mr. Brooks earlier in the day, the handsome, polite, enchanting gentleman had charmed her into taking tea with him on Bournemouth Seafront. He had been so sympathetic to the fact that she was there, taking in the sea air, convalescing from a bad bout of flu, and was staying at the Norfolk Hotel. They had gotten so well that she had accepted his invitation to have dinner in his hotel. He was booked in at the Tollard Royal later that evening. Now the time was approaching midnight and the heavy drinking Mr Brooks had become an insufferable bore, loudly talking about himself to anyone who would listen. She told him she would have to get going and would ask the doorman to hail her a cab. Mr Brooks insisted on walking her back to her hotel. In the end, Doreen relented. As they passed the doorman, Brooks said to him, see you in about an hour, to which Doreen quickly replied, you will see him in about 15 minutes. The doorman watched the pair walk off into the distance and 21-year-old Doreen Marshall was never seen alive again. Two days later, the manager of the Norfolk Hotel, becoming concerned that Doreen had not returned to the hotel, rang the manager of the Tollard Royal, because he knew she had been going there for dinner. The Tollard's manager, knowing that Doreen had been there and with whom she had been with, contacted Mr Brooks and asked him if Miss Marshall had been his dinner date. He denied it was her, but the manager suggested that Brooks contact the police to clarify the situation. Brooks rang the police and they asked him to come to the station to look at a photograph of Dory. While he was being interviewed by DC Souter, the detective thought how much Brooks looked like the photograph of a man wanted for the murder of 32-year-old Marjorie Gardner in London, whose name was Neville Heath. Marjorie's body had been found on the morning of Friday the 21st of June in the Pembridge Court Hotel, Notting Hill, by a chambermaid, Alice Wyatt who after knocking and getting no answer, let herself in to clean the room. She found the terrible sight of Marjorie laid on one of the single beds, on her back, her ankles and wrists were tied with a handkerchief. Her face was bruised, both her nipples had nearly been bitten off, and a poker had been inserted into her and twisted violently. It was found at the autopsy that she had 17 crisscross lash marks on her back and had died of suffocation, but only after the horrific injuries had been inflicted. When Brooks asked if he could have his jacket fetched from his hotel room because he felt cold, an officer obliged and took the opportunity to search the pockets where he found a cloakroom ticket. On a hunch, he went to Bournemouth train station, handed it to the cloakroom attendant, who gave him a suitcase labelled Heath. Inside the case were items of clothing labelled Heath, a blood-stained hat and scarf, one single pearl and a leather-bound riding crop with a cross-weave pattern. This was enough for Brooks to be arrested for the murder of Marjorie Gardner and sent back down to London. The Bournemouth police now feared the worst for missing Doreen, and sadly, five days after leaving the Tollard Royal Hotel, Doreen Marshall's body was found by a waitress, Kathleen Evans, out walking her dog in a rhododendron thicket in Branksome, Chine. 
She was naked apart from one shoe and surrounded by pearls from her broken necklace. She had been badly mutilated. Apart from the defensive wounds on her hands, she had received blows to her head. Her wrists and ankles had been tied. One of her nipples had been completely bitten off. Her throat slashed and a tree branch had been inside, inserted inside her. It was found that Brooks, who we now know is Neville Heath, also had in his possession a pearl from Doreen's necklace and had a pawn ticket showing that he had pawned Dorothy's ring in Parkstone the day after she went missing. In London, under questioning Heath about the murder of Marjorie Gardner, Heath first denied knowing her. He then changed his story and said Marjorie was a close friend and he had let her use his room to entertain a gentleman called Jack while he was out. When he arrived back at 2am, he found her dead and thinking he might get the blame, he caught the train to see his fiancée who was a 19-year-old lady called Yvotte Simmons, who he had met five days before Marjorie's murder. He had wined and dined her but hadn't managed to get her back to his hotel room, so he arranged to meet her the next day and changed tack. He made a proposal of marriage and that did the trick. She spent the night with him and the next morning she caught the train back to her parents' home in Worthing newly engaged. When Heath arrived at Yvonne's parents' house on the day Marjorie Gardner's body was found, they took an instant liking to the well-spoken, charming, tall, handsome airman. He gave his fiancée some story about staying in the same hotel in London as a woman that was murdered there and seeing that a likeness of him had now been printed in the papers saying that he was a person of interest he told his new fiance he was going to sort things out with the police he in fact caught a train to bournemouth with the police in london now informed of the murder of doreen marshall in bournemouth the evidence was becoming overwhelming Heath stood trial at the Old Bailey on the 24th of September 1946 for the murder of Marjorie Gardner. He wanted to plead guilty, but his defence team pleaded with him to change his mind until he told them, all right, put me down for not guilty, old boy. His defence tried to argue he was not guilty due to insanity. But this was rubbished by two doctors who had examined him in prison and testified that while Heath was a sadist and a psychopath, he was by no means insane. The jury agreed and took just one hour to find him guilty and he was sentenced to death. On the morning of his execution, on Wednesday the 16th of September 1946, the governor of Pentonville prison went into Heath's cell and asked if he would like a drink. Heath said he would like a whiskey, and he said, you may as well make it a double, sir. He was, a few minutes later, hanged by the executioner, Albert Pierpoint. Now, if you listen to this channel regularly, you know I have a bit of a thing about those ghoulish characters who worked for Madame Tussauds. Now, I know the days of one of them standing directly under the trap door, waiting for the body to stop bouncing so he could slap a bucket full of plaster of Paris on the very recently deceased to get the death mask and rush it back to the studio to get it on display were over. But all the same, to Swords had a man in the trial all the way through, doing drawings from all angles, getting all his measurements and details. And as soon as Heath fell through the trapdoor, 
one of Tussaud's men rang through telling them to get the already finished likeness unveiled for the inevitable queue of eager customers. Now it turned out after the trial that Heath had met Marjorie Gardner before in a hotel room. She was a fan of bondage and had only been saved on that occasion by a hotel detective who hearing her cry for help had barged into the room but Heath managed to escape. Now why she agreed to meet up with him again we will never know. So what do we know about Neville George Cleebly Heath? He was born in 1917 in Ilford, Essex to parents William and Bessie Heath. They were a middle class family and Neville was a spoilt child who with no discipline grew up thinking he could do what he liked and he did. When he was only 10 he had to move schools after attacking a female classmate. When he was 15 and now at a boarding grammar school he attacked a young girl at a party but managed to convince the girl's father not to report it to the school as it was just hijinks caused by excess alcohol. In 1935 he enlisted in the Royal Air Force. He fully qualified as a pilot by 1936 but by 1937 having been lying and stealing to keep up the pretense of him coming from a high class background he knew the game was up and ran away. He was found hiding out at his parents house in Wimbledon and returned to his squadron and court martialed. After being dismissed from the Royal Air Force he was sent to prison for three years for burglary and when he was released the Second World War had just started and he joined the Royal Army Service Corps. He was posted to the Middle East but once again his past caught up with him and he was shipped back to England but they stopped off in South Africa and Heath took this opportunity to jump ship, make his way to Johannesburg and using one of his aliases joined the South African Air Force, rising to the rank of captain. One thing, Heath wasn't a coward and while piloting his plane they were hit by enemy fire. The plane went down. Heath was the last person to bail out staying at the controls of the plane until the rest of his crew had successfully bailed out first. He was finally court martialed for wearing medals he wasn't entitled to wear and dismissed from the South African Air Force. He made his way back to England but being t after being told he would never be allowed back into the Royal Air Force he took to living a life of stealing and fraud and charming young ladies. Which is where we found him at the beginning of this story. What switch was flicked to suddenly change him into a killer we probably will never know. So anyway what do you think of that? So as usual here is your warning. I'm about to waffle. So if you're rolling your eyes and reaching for the off switch let me just say quickly thank you so much for listening and see you next time. And if you are a murder at bedtime masochist who is staying up to listen to my gobbledygook then I'm well chuffed. Firstly if you listen to this on the podcast and you fancy commenting on the episode you can find me on Instagram as murder at bedtime with Lyndon all one word. Please let me know what you think or tell me a case that you might like me to cover. And please, if you're watching on YouTube, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and ding the little bell for new episode notifications. As you may know by now, I have a second channel called The Exiled Yellow Belly on YouTube, which is just me and my camera videoing interesting sights or myths, legends, ghosts, graveyards, etc. 
it's in its infancy at the moment but hopefully it will grow in time but if it doesn't it doesn't I really enjoy making them and if five people are watching I'm well happy I don't monetize anything I do I already have a job I do this completely as a hobby there will never be any adverts sponsorship buy me a coffee or merchandise although I did have a mug a mug made once for me personally anyway last week I went on a ghost hunt with my daughter to Wickham Caves the home of the Hellfire Club and we had a lot of fun so I'm gonna put a video of that up this weekend it's mostly a Ouija session we took part in and I know that people have mixed feelings about these things and I've already had a couple of messages saying I really shouldn't mess with things like that and that is and that's fair enough but we basically were more amused by it than scared but if you don't want to watch it then I totally understand and finally I'd like to put a shout out to my favorite two friends I met through being fellow podcaster firstly is Debbie Q of the right shoe podcast who hasn't been very well recently but has turned the corner and I am mighty relieved as well as being very very pleased that she's on the road to recovery big hugs Deb and secondly my buddy Lindsay from stolen from me podcast YouTube channel she is not just very talented but she's also an amazing lady so thank you for being a friend and for all your support Linz anyway I think that's way too much waffle for one night thank you as always you know that I think you are all awesome see you next time and sleep well